Hello, welcome to second semester, everybody. Um, we're going to start off with the concepts of evolution, natural selection, and population genetics over this lecture and the next one. So let's first take a look at what evolution actually is. Evolution is change over time in a particular species. Some evidences for evolution come from fossils, embryology, anatomy, vesti vestigial structures, and molecular biology. Fossils can include casts and molds, like you see on the upper left, trace fossils, like you can see on the upper right, or lower left, the petrified fossils, which you see on the megalodon tooth on the upper right, and also amber or frozen fossils, which you find in the lower right. There's a couple of ways of dating fossils. The first one is called relative dating, and that's when you look at the layers that you find a fossil in. We know from the geologic uniformity principles that the lower layers are older than the top layers, barring other factors, like uplift and turnover and folding and faulting. Um, so with that in mind, we can relatively date saying this one in this lower layer is older than this one in this layer above it. However, we don't know what the actual dates of those particular layers are without radiometric dating. Radiometric dating focuses on radioactive isotopes to get an accurate date. And there's a lot more to it than that, but I'm not going to give you more than that because you don't need it. Um, the two most common radioactive elements that we look at are carbon-14, which is only good for up to 50,000 years old. So people like archaeologists that study ancient human civilizations tend to use that. And also potassium-40, which goes from 50,000 to about 1.3 million years ago. The fossil record is used to construct a history of life on Earth. And the earliest fossils that we have of living things is 3.5 billion years old. And they're uh, stomatolites, which show ancient bacterial mats. Embryology is another study for evidence for evolution. Uh, the saying is that embryology reflects phylogeny. Phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a particular species. And so you can kind of see the stages through which it went through as a species in order to come out to what today looks like. So on this slide, we have a bunch of different vertebrates. There's a salamander, a human, a pig, a chicken, a cow, a turtle, a fish, a rabbit. Um, so if you take a look at these, you'll see that they're all very, very similar. They all have gills, tail, <laughs> they have a big eyeball, etc. So one of the things that would be interesting for you to do is to list what you think each one is. I'll go over that list again. A human being, a chicken, a fish, a rabbit, a turtle, a salamander, a cow, and a pig. So once you think you've gotten that, we're going to look at second stage of development. And you can see that the less stages that a, a, phylogen, a phylogenetic line has gone through, uh, the, more, uh, the earlier you can tell what it is. So when you take a look here, remember we still have a fish a chicken, a human, a salamander, a rabbit, a turtle, a cow, and a pig. And you can see that we can kind of tell which one the fish and the salamander are at this second stage of development. So list the ones that you think each one is, and then we'll go on to the third stage of development. So you can kind of tell which one each one is now. Um, one of the things that you need to remember with embryological evidence is that the more evolutionary distant an organism is from another, the earlier you can identify its differences from the others as far as in development. Anatomy is another area where we use evolutionary thought uh, to support it. Studying comparative anatomy can help biologists to identify interrelatedness. For example, analogous structures. Analogous structures don't show common ancestry, but they do show common functions. So you can see here there's a wing of a moth, a pteranodon, a bird, and a bat. They are not the same. They're not even from the same lines. But homologous structures are. 
They show common ancestry, but they may have been modified over time. And you can see that the bones are identical. They've just taken on different shapes in each line. So if you take a look at this one, uh, this was a famous internet photo that went around for years and years and years. Um, and it says surfer with shark. Well, it's not a shark, it's a dolphin. Um, but everybody thought it was a shark because of the way the shape looked in the wave. So is this an example of a homologous structure or an analogous structure? Also in anatomy, there's the concept of vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are body structures that have a reduced or non-functional um, function that may have been more useful for an ancestral species, but is no longer functional in the current species. For us, we have a vestigial appendix. We don't use it anymore, but earlier, um, earlier related species had something called a cecum, which allowed them to harvest pr extra protein out of their food, which was more vegetable based. Additionally, if you look to the right, this picture shows a vestigial claw, which is found on the sides of pythons, showing the remainders that they used to have legs, just like lizards. Um, there is a little vestigial hip structure inside of the python, but you can see this claw, one on each side of the python. Finally, we look at molecular biology to show interrelatedness and also evolutionary distance. There was a project called the Tree of Life Project, which is what this is a picture of. And it was a massive international effort to compare DNA sequences of thousands of different organisms. The more similar the DNA sequences or amino acid sequences are, the more related the two organisms are. And this resulted in a massive shift in how we actually classify organisms in modern biology. For example, uh, the concept of archaeobacteria did not exist before the Tree of Life project, but we found out that there's more difference between archaeobacteria and eubacteria than there is between you and a blade of grass, genetically. So um, they had to have their own group instead of being grouped together in a concept called Monera. Now, some of you may be using really outdated textbooks, and they still use the Five Kingdom concept, and they use the term Monera. Well, just to let you know how old that is, that term got thrown away in 1968. So, um, if you're using a textbook that old, that's still using the old terminology, at that time, they still classified mushrooms as plants, by the way. Um, so, in, if you're still using stuff that's that old, you may want to consider the source of information that you're using for your biology studies. You can also see here from the chart that the closer two organisms are, the greater the percentage of DNA nucleotides they share. This means that the two organisms split from a common ancestor more recently if they share more DNA. And if you take a look here, humans and chimpanzees share 93.7% of our DNA. Um, and so you can say we split off the same from a common ancestor much more recently than we did the, with, say, a lemur, which only shares 48.4% of our DNA. So that concludes our sources of evidence for um, evolutionary thought, and we will go on into population genetics and species diversity in the next lecture. Have a great day.